Havel didn't have a Lord Sol, he only had a will of stone, but by will alone, he became a monster. The beginnings of Havel's life are obscure. Who was he? The man who rose up to stand alongside the gods? We do not know where he came from, where he was born, or even if he was human. But we do know that from as early as he could hold a weapon, he must have trained. Endlessly pushing himself, endlessly gaining in strength and endurance, and keeping unwavering faith in the warrior he would become. And by the war against the ancient dragons, he had earned his place on the battlefield, as a compatriot of Lord Gwyn. When this war broke out, he had proven himself a mighty warrior, though he was not one of Gwyn's four knights. But during the war, he proved himself to be one of Anor Londo's greatest assets. For Havel had become a monster, and he had waited for this day, for a true challenge. After all, monsters seek out monsters. Havel favoured a weapon and shield. He disliked artifice. He distrusted conjurers and magicians. The intellect and its fiddling had no place on the battlefield. Try to be too clever and you would slip up and one slip up meant death. Faith was something he could understand better, and on rare occasions he could be persuaded to use miracles. Peers would suggest he heal up before he returned to battle, and Havel would sometimes oblige them, but that was as far as it went. Gwyn Silver Knights may have thrown the miracle of lightning, but Havel would rely solely on his strength. And it worked. He crushed the mineral dragons mercilessly beneath his blows. These lizards, who called themselves Stone, had now met Rock. He slew countless dragons, but one duel pushed Havel to his limits. In a battle to shake the foundations of the earth, Havel slew his mightiest foe yet. And from the corpse of this marvellous specimen, he decided to take a memento. Casting aside the trusty weapon he had been using, one forged by the gods, he would take up a new weapon. From the jaw of his slain foe, Havel wrapped his hands around it, and heaved with all his strength. He wrenched it out from the root, drawing it from the eternal jaw. Only Havel was ever able to draw a tooth from an ancient dragon. It was unbreakable, and it would now be his eternal weapon. But Havel didn't only wield a tooth, he crafted much more from stone. To show his faith in rock, he made a ring decorated simply with this element. His shield was hewn from stone, and seemed to be almost scaled, as though it was carved from the joints of a stone dragon. His armour was stone, enormous and jagged, almost like the bones of an enormous stone spine. Havel the monster wastes nothing. It was the first time Havel would draw from the power of dragons to make it his own, and marked the start of a complicated relationship. But Havel draws from more than the power of dragons. His strength stat was also built with a quality diet. Today's video is sponsored by Factor 75. Lore analysis takes time, and so does cooking. The value of having a healthy meal quickly really adds up when you're busy. More time means you get more things done at work, and have more freedom when the work is done. Factor 75 saves you time and stress. There's no plan or prep, no cleanup or mess. And also for meat eaters, vegan or vegetarian, there are even low calorie and keto diets available. For us, the main cause of stress with fast meals is how healthy the food is. But unlike junk food, Factor 75 is made with great, nutritious ingredients, so you can save on time without compromise. So get 50% off your first Factor Box and free wellness shots for life using my link. That means you can choose two free wellness shots from three available flavours for every order while you're an active subscriber. Click the link in the description or scan the QR code with your phone. And if you want to support Hawkshaw directly, make sure to use our link below, even if you decide to try Factor 75 a day or two from now. This really really supports our channel, so thank you. Now back to Havel, the picture of health. Havel inspired others with his prowess on the battlefield. Many gravitated to him. Devotees of Havel were ready to follow in his footsteps. And so, Havel became a leader, not just a soldier. He would train his men and gift them the secrets of combat, and in return, they would show unwavering faith by donning his ring and carrying the heaviest of loads. But with the Great War over and battles far between, the great leader Havel would have to adapt. Havel had begun to have faith in more than stone, 
As a compatriot of Gwyn, he had seen the Lord of Light conquer dragons. He had watched him grow a civilization and create a great sun under which all could rest. Just as his men had faith in him, he had faith in his leader, Gwyn. He had fought for the gods, and would continue to stand by them in new ways in times of peace. He became a bishop, Bishop of the Way of White, the Way of Gwyn. As bishop, he would serve the light, but others had also been given new roles since the war. A dragon, Havel's former enemy, had been granted dukedom after betraying his own. Havel, who had shown no mercy on dragons, found it a bitter pill to swallow that a treacherous, serpent-legged dragon could be allowed among the ranks of the gods didn't sit right with Havel. As the years went on, this resentment soured. In time, Seath may have won the hand of Gwyn's daughter, and became even more involved with the gods. The influence of the serpent dragon grew, as did his knowledge, as he studied for long years in the archives. And Havel, who had always rejected magic, grew wary of what could be going on at the top of the mountain. Havel turned away from Seath, he did not acknowledge him in public life, and wanted nothing to do with him in private. His disdain for magic increased, as the grandfather of sorcery shared his discoveries with others. With time, the power of sorcery grew ever stronger. Great schools flourished, and scholars and heroes discovered yet more about the secrets of magic. Havel realised the power of sorcery was too great to ignore. He realised that he would have to craft a means to counteract this growing threat. After all, Seath had betrayed a ruling faction once already. Havel turned his mind to the problem. He couldn't rely on his armaments against magic, and would have to fight fire with fire. He had to invent a counterspell. While this was not Havel's talent, he was no Logan. He had a will of stone. He would not stop until he found a solution. And once again, his will of rock succeeded. He developed a new defense against sorcery that drew on faith. Defense, after all, was one of Havel's specialties. He channeled his love of it, and his faith in it, into a new miracle. And so, Magic Barrier was born. An impressive miracle, but Havel had carved rock for years. He was a man of persistence. He knew he could do better. Havel continued to hone his understanding, and his faith, and with time, he created Great Magic Barrier. A remarkable miracle which boasted powerful magic defense. He would now be ready to face any spellcaster, while still relying on his time-proven dragon tooth to deal the finishing blow. For his warriors who couldn't wield his newest creation, he would teach the simpler, yet more reliable miracle. His followers now stood ready to counter physical and magic attacks. And so the bishop's life went on, and while he disliked and distrusted Seath, it had not turned to hatred, yet for it would take much more than suspicion for Havel to make Seath his sworn enemy. Slowly, the sun faded. Eventually, gods began to leave. A few at first, then more and more departed, their shadows long in the dimming light. Havel stayed, loyal to Lord Gwyn. Deep below Lordran were other problems. The demons of Isolith were stirring. They were stealing from the flow of humanity. Havel had begun to have his doubts about the use of humanity as fuel, but under Gwyn there was at least some balance, and the demons disturbed it. Gwyn had to do what was necessary. Did Havel stand by Gwyn's side once more in the fight against the demons? Did he crush the chaos demons beneath his dragon tooth hammer? Did his armor of stone hold off the firestorms of Isoleth? If he fought in this way, he did not go on to join his lord to be burnt in the rekindling. Instead, Bishop Havel continued to do his duty in the surviving society of Lordran, and he did this through the many years of Lordran dimming, doing his duty as part of a noble but lost cause, guided by his unbending will. War became a distant memory. Havel had been for centuries a man of the church, a family man, but this memory still flickered inside him, a flame that would never go out. But in a time of peace, he had to ignore these memories, those times were past, and yet, he could not say he was satisfied with his life of routine, until one day, a beautiful member of his congregation drew his attention. This maiden kindled something in Havel, and he in her. The two of them fell in love, and kept it secret from the church. In a whirlwind romance, they took whatever moment they could to spend time together, during the events of the church, there would often be excuses to meet, if only for a short time. 
or if paths were to cross during two pilgrimages, by chance, of course. In a secret gesture of love, Havel gave a ring, the ring of the bishop. This delicate ring could not be identified from afar. It was simple. It could be anyone's. But it was his, and it meant the world to her. It symbolized their love, and she wore it everywhere, whether at the most stately church ceremony, or on missions in faraway lands. As a bishop, Havel could not be seen having a relationship with a woman of the church, and in the end, their secret would bring tragedy, but not in an expected way. Atop the mountain, Seed's experiments were becoming more and more bizarre. He had begun experimenting on human women. Whispers of his madness had begun to spread, but no one believed the rumors that his research could be this depraved. Seath had a specific set of parameters when choosing test subjects. He would send his channelers to abduct young women, but not just any young women, for Seath required them to be unmarried, and preferably with no romantic history at all, because Seath, for reasons known only to himself, needed a guarantee that the women in his experiments were not pregnant. Havel's lover had kept her relationship secret, so secret that no one knew she may not have fit Seath's requirements. To a channeler, this was a young woman of the church on a pilgrimage. She had to be unmarried. A lover was not permitted. She was perfect for abduction. Delivering the woman to Seath, the old dragon believed he had a guarantee that she was not with child. However, little could Seath know that he was about to kindle a hatred within Havel that would change the fate of Laudron. Seath imprisoned Havel's love in the archives. She would be next in line for his experimentation but this time, it would not go unnoticed. Havel found out she was missing when she did not arrive at their next meeting, but perhaps a member of the clergy had asked her where she was going and she had to cancel. He would not worry, for a while at least. Time passed. Then word came to him that a member of a congregation had vanished. Havel asked for a name, and held still as a rock while they gave the name of his true love. Rumors that women had been leaving the church had been going on for some time. People wondered if these women had fallen in love and wanted to escape the church rules, but Havel now knew otherwise. She loved him, so she wouldn't run away for a lover when he was already within the church itself. Something more sinister had happened. But what? Havel couldn't know where she was, and so he could not rescue her. In the archives, she must have wondered if Havel could find her, hoped that he didn't forget her, asked the gods why he had not rescued her. These thoughts circled her mind as she waited for the man she loved, tormenting her. With horrific experiments waiting for her below, and still no Havel to save her, she grew panicked in her cell. The noises of those who had been just like her, now writhing like serpents in their cages, meant she couldn't sleep. She couldn't eat. Her mind began to warp. Did she hollow in the end? Or did she prefer to die by her own hand, rather than survive to become one of Seath's mistakes? Once Havel found out his love had passed on, he swore Seath would be his enemy until one of them was dead. This also marked the end of his devotion to the Way of White. The Way of White had allowed the one he loved to be captured, instead of protecting her. Here, Havel's faith in the gods was broken, and he began to question their actions. If the gods could let a traitorous snake like Seath into the heart of Anolondo, to live among them, to abduct their people, do nothing to stop his twisted experiments, and then abandon their duty when Laudron darkened, these were not gods, but fickle overlords. The use of humanity began to disgust Havel. The gods were no different from demons. They still consumed the innocent. They were just better at the art of illusion. Havel would no longer take part in the sanctified consumption of the innocent. The humans may have dark within them, but to shepherd them in such high numbers, or to maintain a faded sun, had no honor. Gwyn had at least sacrificed himself, but since Gwyn's departure, Anor Londo had become corrupted there was no greater good anymore. The rampant corruption led Havel to have even more doubts. Doubts about his old enemies, the ancient dragons. Doubts about the state of the world, the relationship between humanity and lords. Something wasn't right, 
something needed to be fixed, and Havel thought of a solution to take the power back. With his faithful men, Havel began plotting to overthrow the gods. In the Undead Burg, a squalid collection of residences where the lords would not think to look, Havel set up his meetings. Havel would do anything to overthrow the tyrants, even align himself with those many would call evil. One such man was the Earl of Kareem, famed for experiments almost as gruesome as Seath, but with undeniable results. Some of Havel's loyal men joined him too, those whose faith were beyond question. They were only violent on the battlefield, unlike the Earl. A knightess, who swore not to tell her bumbling husband the plot, was a mighty warrior, ready to do battle for the cause. Another was Donal, a curious man who Havel saw as an independent thinker. This collector said he was willing to help. His mind was sharp, and his breadth of knowledge helped a great deal with the plans, even if Havel had his misgivings. He could always sense that part of Donal's motivations were to keep treasure after the overthrow of the gods. This proved a grave mistake, for Donal's greed for rare treasures could be used by others. Sat around at tables, the plotters would discuss through the night, whispering in hushed voices, the dingy room lit by candles. As they discussed the mounting injustices of the rule without Gwyn, Havel became more and more appalled that he had served so long as bishop. He would now try to fight against injustice, instead of being at the head of a church that spread it. Among the group at the table was one who had discovered a secret entrance that could be of use, an entrance to Havel's ancient battleground. The plan slowly took form, and the number of plotters grew, if only by a little. The plan was simple. The power of the gods rests upon the agreements between them. Nito had agreed to hold safe the right of kindling, a power only provided to the gods. This was the power with which the lords channeled the energy from humanity into themselves. It was the key to their rule. Steal it, and the shackle on humanity could be removed, or the power gained from their energy could be redirected to form a new society. Havel and his co-conspirators travelled down through the Great Hollow, and trained in secret there, beneath the world they would overthrow. As they did so, Havel reflected upon his might, his strength, and how much of it was thanks to dragons. His trusty tooth had never broken, his armour had never cracked. Wielding his tooth in preparation of his rebellion, he thought about his old enemy. The dragons were different to mortals in many ways. They did not need to take advantage of each other to survive. They did not have to endlessly chase the good and avoid the bad. Disparity brought heat, but also cold. Perhaps disparity brought too much suffering, and as the sun faded, the suffering was not outweighed by joy and the good was shared amongst too few. Another battle compatriot may have joined at this point with similar doubts, the firstborn son. Armed with a spear that once pierced dragons, he had also come to doubt the righteousness of his past conquests. In the entire Age of Fire, humanity had done nothing but suffer for the sake of a few lords, who squabbled amongst themselves, falling out with each other, fickle in love, envious of power instead of happy with their lot. Havel and the God of War were kindred spirits, both trusted in their prowess, and now shared doubts. And while they travelled together below the earth, did they find something else? Today, at the end of a sand dune, flanked by crystal waters, is hidden an ancient dragon. Did Havel meet this creature? Did he become him? Was this creature placed there later by Seath? Did Havel and his clan worship this dragon? Only Havel knows. Did this new cult give scales in devotion to the dragon, the same scales that they so readily peeled in the previous war? How things had changed. They had destroyed the dragons to have disparity rule supreme, and now they dreamed to leave disparity, to live forever. And this was not pride, it was not immortality that tempted them, but an escape from the vicious cycle of pain and pleasure, to achieve enlightenment. And they did not seek it only for themselves, they sought to bring an end to the harsh cycles of disparity to all the living. With leaders such as Havel, this new world could be built, but not while the old gods stood in their way. After much preparation and training, Havel and his band of rebels were ready to carry out their plans. 
Havel made sure to stash his treasures deep within Anor Londo, where his old allies would not find them. He could not be seen wearing his famous armour and weapon during the rebellion. If it succeeded, he would retrieve his treasures in the empty palace of the gods. But for now, he must go not as Havel, but disguised as one of many seeking to overthrow the gods. He left an occult club protected inside a mimic. This caused extra harm to the gods and their kin. Should the plot fail, and he managed to return to Lordran unidentified, he could pretend that nothing had happened. He could still have this weapon ready to finish his plans from inside the capital. So Havel returned to Ash Lake, meeting his allies down below. All were quiet. They had trained long enough. Barely a word was spoken as they climbed up the hollow arch tree that led to Nito's domain. The clunk of stone armour and the rattle of the Earl's purging stones at his belt were the only sounds that broke the silence. One of their number was missing, Donal. Where had that fancy treasure hunter got to? It didn't matter now. Let the magpie hunt elsewhere. Now was the time for warriors, not adventurers. As they climbed, the air grew cold. The opening became clear up ahead, but it was only a grim cave barely lit by the odd torch. Except, something was wrong. Was it too silent? Was the scent in the air that came from Nito's domain of those yet living? Or was it an echo from back below the arch tree that they had heard? Havel couldn't say, but in that moment, he knew they had walked into an ambush. He had survived too many to ignore the signs. He broke the silence, shouting the order to his men to charge, and he charged with them, out in front. The arrows of Anolondo's soldiers rained down upon them, impossible to block in the darkness. But the armour of the rebels was strong enough to survive the first wave. Soon, the forces met in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Havel and his rebels cut down many of Anolondo's troops, but the numbers they faced were too great to conquer. They had been planning to enter Nito's domain in secret with only a small force. They were not ready to face an army. They retreated back down the arch tree, fighting as they went. To channel the enemy army into the narrow arch tree meant that the better fighters would have an advantage. Havel was an expert tactician, and this was so simple it might save them. But there was one problem. There was a second force attacking them from below. The forces of Seath. It was at this point that Havel knew they had been betrayed. He should have known. A dragon worshipper who craved treasure. Greed was disparity, and Donal had been tempted away by the promise of treasure. Havel sensed defeat was near. With the rebels fighting on two fronts, they couldn't last long. As his force fragmented, they lost each other in the darkness. Many perished to Seath's creatures down below, dying in the sand. Others died within the tree, and some fell in Nito's domain. Then, by sheer force of miracles, magic, and perhaps dragon fire that raged within the arch tree, the arch tree split. With the support for the land above broken, a portion of Nito's domain fell with the arch tree, and the light flooded the domain of the dead. All who were fighting within the fallen piece of the arch tree died as it tumbled into the sea. The fight was over. Some who fought on solid ground managed to flee through Nito's domain, finding refuge and hiding out ever since. Some may have capitalised on the chaos. Some may have made it back out from the beach below, escaping Seath's minions. But the rest died. Was Havel the Rock cut down that day? Or did he live on to pursue his dream, to become one with his old enemy, the ancient dragons? Certainly, we see those who look like Havel in the ages since. Some turn to dark, and some turn to dragons, along with the nameless king. Havel was mighty, but could he have resisted the strength of Seath and the gods combined? What is certain is that if he worshipped the ancient dragon of Ash Lake, that dragon has now been discovered by Seath, who has survived to this day. If Havel had lived, would he not have taken his revenge? It has been more than a century since Havel's rebellion, and Seath lives on. Havel wouldn't forgive his arch nemesis a second offence, but Havel is patient, and he is as old as the Age of Fire itself. Perhaps he is only biding his time. 
While the mystery of his whereabouts remains, what is certain is that his legacy lives on. Though his rebellion failed, he will always be remembered as the mightiest of heroes, and the ages since prove it. The number of his devotees has not waned through countless cycles. Even now, the legends of his prowess inspire fledgling warriors. The thought of fighting him still sends fear down the spine, and the faith that Havel will one day return lives on.